Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, also known by many of you as Mr. Valuation. I want to welcome you once again to another Subscriber Request Tuesday, where I try to cover stocks that YouTube subscribers have asked me to cover in these various videos. And what I'm going to look at today are real estate investment trusts. I'm going to look at about seven REITs for you and talk a little bit about the nature of the beast as well. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's a subject that I think is interesting because early, very early in my career, I was taught a very valuable lesson that I really feel is critically important as it relates to investing in the general sense. And what I was presented was by a, a gentleman who was actually worked for a mutual fund company, and he inter was introducing the concept that he referred to as lonership versus ownership. All right, and obviously, loanership is investing in fixed income, bonds, CDs, annuities, things like that, where ownership was investing in things where you positioned yourself as an owner of the asset, okay? And fixed income investors were typically entitled to earn interest on their money. In other words, they were loaning their money to these various entities and then were receiving interest. And, you know, for the better fixed income investments, at least, they were entitled to get their money back, at least in nominal dollars. You know, of course, inflation would have an impact there. But ownership investments were different. They were riskier, for one thing. And But, you know, the old adage is that, you know, with greater risk should come the potential for much greater returns. And that's what ownership is all about. It's about being the owner of the asset itself. Now, there are many assets that are just pure growth assets. And even things like commodities like gold, you know, silver and other commodities where they don't generate any dividends or, or, you know, produce any type of income distributions, if you will. But then there are also investments that do. And even in the realm of real estate, there's things like raw land that, you know, people own and invest in and just put away for years, but they don't really get any return from that investment in the form of income where there are other pieces of real estate like rental properties and office buildings and, you know, et cetera, where the owner of the real estate is collecting rents and getting, you know, cash flow from the investment itself. But in addition to the income component, the idea of equity or being an owner or ownership is that you also participate in any increase in value that the asset may generate in addition to any income. So when you're looking at total return, it's always a function of growth, capital appreciation, the asset increasing in value, and or income, if any, that it throws off and produces for you. And then you add those two up, growth plus income, and you end up getting your total return. And so real estate is a very interesting asset class in that it can produce both capital appreciation and income. Now, the problem with real estate versus, let's say, investing in typical stocks has always been the issue of liquidity. You know, the advantage of owning real estate, I always like to say, is the fact that it's illiquid. The disadvantage of owning real estate is that it's illiquid because the idea there is that because it's illiquid, because it's not, you know, you can't sell it in a heartbeat like you can a common stock, is that you tend to own it for longer periods of time. And I am a fervent believer in the long-term ownership of good assets, especially appreciating assets or assets that have at least a potential to appreciate. But then the problem with stocks is, the good news about stocks is that they're liquid. The bad news about stocks is that they're liquid because with liquidity comes volatility. And so there's that risk of, you know, day-to-day -day price movement versus the long-term appreciation, the old Ben Graham metaphor. In the short run, the market's a voting machine. In the long run, it's a weighing machine. So, you know, I like ownership because I do believe that in the long run, ownership will pay much better than loanership. But I also acknowledge, and I think it's important to acknowledge, that it has greater risk. But in the terms of real estate, you know, there were laws passed years ago that allowed real estate to list itself publicly traded. So a REIT is really kind of a, kind of a hybrid, if you will, of pure real estate plus, you know, stock ownership. A real estate investment trust, also known as a REIT, gives you the best of both worlds. It becomes liquid real estate, but it usually also is associated with income-producing real estate. Not always, but in the most cases, the vast majority at least, it's income-producing real estate. So let's go ahead and get into the video, and let's look at some REITs that were requested by many of you that I'm going to cover for you. 
Now, before I do that, though, I do want to talk generally about the structure of a real estate investment trust and point out that they do have tax benefits in many cases. In other words, the entity itself gets tax benefits, but in order to qualify as a REIT, it must pay out in dividends to shareholders at least 90% of their taxable income. And again, that income can derive from rents, interest income, management fees, etc. In addition, REITs earn capital gains and losses on the sale of properties. And so investors are keenly interested in how a REIT is performing because it directly affects the dividends they receive. However, REIT performance measurement is complicated and requires a metric more sophisticated than earnings per share. And I'm going to talk about this more throughout the video. So then, you know, this is from the REIT Institute. What's wrong with earnings per share? Earnings divides net revenues, revenues minus all costs, by the number of shares. The problem with earnings per share, or EPS, is that certain costs are non-cash, specifically depreciation and amortization, which are accounting procedures to deduct the cost of long-lived assets over a specific number of years. Amortization and depreciation, we all know about that, at least generally. Non-cash expenses, though, distort the amount of money available for dividends as reported by earnings. Now, there's another factor of earnings which relates to dilution, which I'll cover a little bit later in the presentation or in the video. But REITs are very sensitive to depreciation expense because their major assets are depreciable physical properties. And these expenses don't impact the cash that a REIT makes. So that brings us to FFO, or Funds from Operations. And as the REIT Institute says, to get a better handle on cash flow, the REIT world uses a different metric to measure performance, FFO, or funds from operations. According to Nariat, the National Associate of Real Estate Investment Trust, FFO is equal to a REIT's net income, excluding gains or losses from sales of property, and adding back real estate depreciation. In other words, its FFO is roughly the equivalent to cash flow per share. And later on the fast graph, you'll see that when you are looking at a read on fast graph, we automatically, it automatically reverts to FFO because, again, it's the equivalent. But also, Nariat warns that analysts and companies all don't use the same definition of FFO. This is a little bit troublesome in that, you know, FFO can be complicate the interpretation of looking at the financials of REIT. And also, it ignores certain factors that impact the amount available for shareholder dividends. The adjusted funds from operations was developed to give investors a better indicator of cash available for dividends. That's theoretically the primary benefit of using AFFO, which we also produce on fast graphs. And it's known as funds available for distribution, also known as, I should say, it takes into account adjusted funds from operations, that is, certain costs necessary to operate a portfolio of properties, but that don't show up in net income. AFFO adjusts FFO in two ways, by subtracting capital expenditures and by straight lining, okay? And certain recurring costs necessary for maintaining properties and the revenue streams they generate are not immediately expensed. These costs cover some items in rental units, for example, such as carpets, Venetian blinds, as well as leasing expenses and allowances made to tenants for improvements, etc. These costs are capitalized, treated as assets rather than expenses, and are gradually expensed via the accounting procedure amortization. Although the cost is expensed over a number of years, the cash to pay them is spent up front and therefore reduces the money available for dividends. By subtracting these capitalization costs right away, REITs produce a better picture of funds available for distribution, which is a key thing for AFFO. And then straight lining simply averages rent payments over the life of the tenant's lease. It's an accounting term, not an actual cash flow. So the AFFO calculation subtracts the straight line rent in excess of contract rent, which is the rent cash flow actually received. This removes phantom income not available for distribution. The bottom line is that, in theory, AFFO does the best job of, of reporting the actual cash received by the REIT and, therefore, the amount of cash that can be distributed. However, there is an issue with that, which I'm going to get into and cover as I go into some of these REITs here, and I'm going to show you. I've got seven REITs I'm going to be covering. I've got a specialized REIT, Crown Castle, which is in, you know, essentially 5G, etc. I've got two industrial REITs to show you, a specialized REIT, which is really a, what they call an experiential REIT, and then three healthcare REITs. And healthcare REITs are the ones that I'm asked about most commonly. 
Okay, now I've got these listed in order of price to cash flow and then cash flow yield, okay, which is very similar to the earnings yield that I always talk about when I'm doing these videos, which I consider to be a critical valuation metric. Just like earnings yield, I want to see at least six and a half or seven percent before I get interested. And I want you to notice that several of these REITs have cash flow yields below that. Some are close, like VICI properties here at 5.7% cash flow yield. Healthcare Trust at 6.27. That's getting in the ballpark. Physicians Realty, a little high, but this is a company that is perennially valued richly by the market. And then, of course, the best of all is 9.1% by Omega Healthcare Investors. So let's start with the highest valuations first, and let's look at innovative industrial properties, which is an industrial REIT. Okay, one thing that you can do when you're looking at REITs, you can go into these REITs and look at their website. So would be go to the external links like to Google Finance here and then go into the company's website, which the key is you go in here and it's the leading provider of real estate capital for medical use cannabis industry. Okay, so bottom line, this is a cannabis oriented rate and it's theoretically I mention that because it's primarily more oriented towards growth, which not all REITs are actually oriented towards growth. REITs are often oriented to valuation. But I also want to use this particular one because I, I think it brings a great opportunity for me to illustrate the proper utilization of fast graphs, which I always call a tool to think with. You know, statistics don't lie, as they say, but statisticians are darn liars. And you've got to be careful when you're dealing with statistics. Okay, because, you know, everything is ultimately mathematical based. So let's look at this company. And, you know, I'm looking at the FFO growth rate, and I don't really have one here. So if I cut the time down, I now get a, a REIT that has grown at over 100% per year, 103.59%. So I'm using the price to FFO equal to the growth rate, kind of the Peter Lynch P equals growth you know, or valuation to growth formula. And it, the REIT looks extremely undervalued when I look at it from this aspect, okay? But you need to know what you're looking at. Always check this box. This is 100 times FFO. That's obviously just common sense would tell you it's rich. But that number is a distorted number by some early FFO growth here, if you will, that was really extraordinary, over 650% for, for 2018 which fiscal year is in December, followed by 155% the next year. And then I want you to notice 64%, 37, 38, and 19. So the first thing here, I see a significant reduction in growth going forward. So as I cut time off of this, I start getting more realistic numbers. I'm still using a very high number here. But now, all of a sudden, I'm seeing that the normal price to FFO has fallen down to like 35 times, okay? So that's starting to get a little more realistic, and it's really in line with what the REIT is currently trading at. I drop it another four years and take off another higher period. I'm down to a normal price to FFO of 32, and now on that basis, the REIT would look, you know, slightly overvalued, but this REIT is still looking reasonably valued based on its growth potential. So let's cut one more year off of this, and now all of a sudden we've got FFF grow of 31%, and the REIT still looks reasonably priced. But here's the key point I want to make. I'm always looking at the past to learn from it. So I see this company came out with a lot of growth. Cannabis was originally hot. The performance of this particular REIT has been extraordinary, and it's even thrown off an awful lot of dividend income, I want you to notice, because, you know, they've paid out a nice rich dividend the whole time. The current yield, though, is only 2.77%. If I look at that versus, you know, when, when the REIT was more reasonably priced, where I had a dividend yield of about three and three quarters percent, that would have been a more attractive time, obviously, to buy the REIT. But you use this tool to run through these machinations, if you will. But then critically, when you learn, once you've learned from the past, you should always be thinking about making your buying decisions on the future. Now, of course, the problem with that is that the future is uncertain. It's like I also like to say, the only thing I can say with great certainty about the future is that it's uncertain. All right. So anyway, looking at the future, we see that analysts, and there are eight analysts for 2021, dropping to seven analysts for 2022 and then down to three analysts are looking at really high growth for the next couple of years. 
So even though this stock is very richly valued at a blended price to FFO of 35.6, you can also see that it's expected to grow at about 26.5%. So even then, if I go out here and look at it and I get a reversion to the mean, if it actually ends up the PE or the price to FFO actually drops to 26 times earnings, I'd still have a 17% rate of return. However, if it stayed around this 35 number and I could, you know, pick it here, I could make 30% a year. And if I went, you know, a little higher, I'd make, you know, 34% a year. Somewhere between these two numbers would be realistic if this company continues to trade at that FFO. So I can then also look at the normal price to FFO. But once again here, I get a very distorted picture because of what I showed you earlier, when I was looking at the historical graph, you have these humongous numbers in here that really distort the growth. This is when it really first came out. So when I'm looking at forecasting here, I'm going to look at more realistic price to FFOs. And right back here, I'm back, there's that 35 number I can put in, which has been, you know, currently what it's currently trading at. And I get, you know, an opportunity to make some very nice rates of return if it stays at that level. This is a calculator, okay, and it's a what-if tool. What if it grows at 26% and what if it trades at 35 times earnings? What if it only trades at, you know, 25 or 6 times earnings? Then these are my rates of return. So you can just have some sense. And the reason I'm kind of harping on this here is I always believe in running the numbers out to their most logical conclusions. If I'm making an investment, I don't ever just buy a stock or invest in, or in this case, a REIT, hoping I'm going to make some money. I try to have a reasonable calculation and usually a best case, word case, a bid case, you know, idea of what the, the investment might be able to return me. So this is a very expensive REIT, but it does expect to have a lot of growth into it, but it does have only about a 3% dividend yield, which is above market. This could be a very excellent you know, investment going long term, and the company does have modest debt. So that's Innovative Industrial Properties, which is in the cannabis industry. Now here's Crown Castle. This is actually one of my favorite REITs. The problem is I've never been able to buy the thing. When I've had money available, I was looking for dividend income. When, I, when it was an inexpensive REIT, it wasn't paying any dividends, so I ignored it. But you can see this is a double-digit grower, which is very unusual. It's an investment-grade REIT, triple B minus. does have debt, but what's happening here is because this particular company is so involved with you know connecting us to the internet here, all these infrastructure solutions that the company offers, including you know 5G. They've got you know towers and small cells, etc. And they're you know they've got fiber and Ethernet and so on and so forth. So this is a very you know exciting REIT from a standpoint of where it currently sits in the technology spectrum with new advancements like 5G, edge computing, etc. Coming on to the you know forefront, this is a very exciting REIT. But the problem is everybody knows that and they've driven the price up to where I consider it to be unsustainable. The company did start paying a dividend in 2014 and it does offer a 2.6% dividend yield. But once again, I think that yield is relatively low. I want to be able to buy this REIT when I can get at least a 4 or 5% dividend yield. So, you know, I consider the FFO price here very, very high. Now, I can go ahead and move that to the AFFO, you know, calculation that I talked about earlier in the beginning of this video, because that's also, you know, gives me a better picture of dividend coverage, if you will. I've got good dividend coverage. I think this thing is solid on dividends. The only thing I don't like about Crown Castle is the very, very high valuation. I think it's too expensive to be adding money or for investors to be taking a position today. But it's a very excellent read if you ever get a chance to buy it at an attractive valuation. Stag Industries is another industrial REIT that's you know very, very interesting and attractive. And I'm looking at it here now, FFO, and you can see this nice correlation. Now, when I'm looking at FFO, I often find it be a little better as far as giving me a valuation reference. But I want to make a point about that. These are always just valuation references. Okay, they're in theory what the investment should be worth. And I'm using a, you know, 15 price to FFO, just like I do with earnings for a lot of stocks. 
and this is the real world, so you can look at this graph and see that there's 15, anywhere the price touches that orange line, is trading at 15 times or close to it, FFO in this case. And you can clearly see when it gets above that, it tends to come back rather quickly. When it gets below it, it tends to come back rather quickly. And I used the phraseology reversion to the mean, and I've been challenged on that as a mathematical concept. What I'm really saying is it returns to intrinsic value. And I do want to make that distinction in this video. This constantly returning back to intrinsic value, that would make stag overvalued today. Looking in the future, it's expected to grow at about 5%. Long-term growth for stag is about 3.5%. I think those numbers are realistic. Consequently, I'd be looking at you know buying this stock at a better valuation. As far as AFFO, I have a very similar conclusion when I'm looking at AFFO. The only thing I'm looking at here is I do see very good, you know, solid dividend coverage for the REIT. The company has about 41% debt and it has no credit rating, but it's a good REIT, but I do consider it expensive. I'm going to go quicker. Here's another one where I really think you want to use the tool properly because you've got these ridiculous growth rates here in the early years. So you start calling this down and you get to about an eight and three quarter percent, you know, growth rate. And again, this is another specialized REIT. This is an experiential REIT, as I pointed out. And one of their, you know, big claims to fame here is they own the world-renowned Caesars Palace, you know, in Las Vegas, Nevada. And they own 28 leading gaming facilities. Now, one thing you want to be careful of, you know, shutdowns. You know, when I look at you know, what happened during COVID, of course, this company did have some issues, but interestingly enough, it did far better than a lot of other, for example, mall REITs and things like that were physical properties. But the key I want to get at is here, you want to shorten this time frame to where you start getting into some more realistic numbers, because note how growth rates are slowing down with this company. When I look at forecasting, I'm getting forecasts of about 7.5%. The long-term forecast is about 7.79. 7 to 8% makes a lot of sense to me. This company does, you know, provide me a 4-plus percent dividend yield. It's had good long-term performance, if you will. It's even outperformed the market slightly and produced significantly more dividend income, which gives it a great, you know, advantage over the overall market, you know, for the last several years. So this is only going back to 2019 has a lot of yield. It's only double B rated, which REITs, you know, the highest rated REITs are like triple B plus. And I think there's only one or two of those if I don't recall. But anyway, this is BICI properties, an experiential REIT. And if I look at it, of AFFO, once again, I get a very similar picture I did with the FFO. It's pretty reasonably priced relative. It does give me good, you know, opportunities if I use normal multiples it could be inexpensive, but again, the normal multiples I would like to use are closer to the 15 multiple. So this is one that's not necessarily expensive, but not necessarily cheap, but it is interesting. Physicians Realty, Trust, or Doc, the market I mentioned earlier in the video, it likes to put a premium valuation on this one. It does offer almost a, right at a 5% dividend yield. It gives me about a 5.5% AFFO yield, if you will. And this is looking at the dividend covered, a little spotty on the um, AFFO, you know, covering the dividend. So that's, to me, a slight negative with Doc. I also want to notice that if I shorten this time frame here, the growth rate goes from 15% to about 3%, and forecast growth is about 3%. So, you know, even longer term, we're only looking at 6 or so percent. So I don't see a lot of growth here. This would be primarily one that I would look at for yield, okay? And I just wanted to make that point. Healthcare Trust of America is, you know, very, very similar situation. It's got a nice 4.6% dividend yield, reasonably priced now based on funds from operations. And if I go to AFFO or the one that, you know, shows me better dividend coverage, which is, you know, more realistic to the dividend, again, it's covering the dividend with AFFO, but in some years only barely. The payout ratio of AFFO is actually very high on this one. That's, these are things that you should be taking into consideration where you're considering investing in these things. Now, I do want to go into Omega Healthcare here as my last one that I'm going to show you. And there's a couple of things about REITs. I'm going to just kind of use this to summarize. Part of the reason we don't use earnings, and I mentioned this, I alluded to this earlier in the video, is because earnings don't really paint a good picture for REITs. You'll notice that the earnings, and there's almost no earnings and price correlation. 
The reason for that is that almost every one of these REITs I've showed you tend to be very, very dilutive. REITs are always raising capital. And what they're doing with that capital then is, you know, buying additional real estate, if you will, and that to generate, you know, cash producing property. So they're very, very dilutive to their shareholders, which means their earnings per share are very, very, very difficult to calculate. That's one thing that I think you need to be aware of. Now, what I'm also going to do here, for those of you who've been, you know, patiently waiting for the new version to FastGraph, we're starting to test it. It's getting close. We still, you know, I can't give you an exact date, but we're getting very close. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and, and give you a picture of the new version of Fast Graphs here and let you see it and just see how close we are. And I want to make a couple of points for you. One is the first thing I want you to notice is that we have decided to add weekly closing prices where on the current version, we only have monthly closing stock prices. Okay, so we're going to be giving you a little more detail on the prices and gives you a little better valuation perspective. We're also adding metrics. We're going to be adding uh, things like sales. Okay, so you can see how the company performs relative to its sales. In other words, this is kind of the equivalent of a price to sales. The normal you know, price to sales for this company has been about 7.8 times sales. The company currently trades at around 9.5 times sales, so that would be a little pricey based on sales. But yet if I look at it with, you know, the normal FFO and AFFO, it looks like a very inexpensive REIT. And by the way, for disclosure, I'm very long this REIT, and I do like it. It's a very good healthcare REIT. AFFO shows very excellent dividend coverage. The company's had good long-term performance, a good dividend record. Um, so, you know, Omega is one that I really do like and was asked, you know, to look at. So, you know, there you go looking at various REITs. Here's the new version of Fast Graphs just to give you some idea. The other thing I wanted you to notice before I leave is how quickly I can change metrics. I also, by the way, like to look at REITs through things like EBITDA. And when I cover a lot of companies here, I don't get in as much detail as I would like. I also look at it for EBIT or, you know, earnings before interest and taxes, you know. So, you know, you, you can see that these valuation references all give you a better idea of when the, you know, an attractive entry point would be or when a good time to be thinking about selling, et cetera. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival. We're giving you a long dissertation here on my Subscriber Tuesday on REITs. REITs are, you know, liquid real estate, if you will. That's their advantage. That's also their disadvantage. But again, as I mentioned, because of volatility. But anyway, here's just a handful of REITs that you could look at and maybe add. The beauty of it is, in a case like Omega, I've got a 7.5% dividend yield. These are very, very excellent for income investments, but they're also very excellent investments as far as looking at them for capital growth as well. You can see that Omega historically has been an awesome dividend producer, but also an awesome capital appreciation producer. That's why I prefer loanership over ownership. Well, it's been Chuck Carwell saying thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a like and you know ring the bell and subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And by the way, if you haven't looked, you might want to take a little closer look at Fast Graphs and you know take our free trial and try Fast. I think it's a tool. It's an indispensable tool for me at least for evaluating you know stocks of all categories and all kinds. And and it is a tool to think with. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you again very soon.